Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hey, thanks for joining me today. You can find this in all episodes as well as show notes on BeBoldPodcast.com. When you listen to those previous episodes, you're going to discover strong women who have overcome adversity, they've started businesses, they've challenged themselves in a variety of ways, they've traveled the world, and they've attained status as world-class athletes, and they've even given up their secure jobs to pursue their dreams and passions. I find inspiration and pearls of wisdom in every one of these conversations. These are women who really motivate me and make me think about my own path to success and happiness. My conversation today is with Nicole Antoinette, and she was one I was really looking forward to for the very reasons I just stated. Nicole is the host of the wildly popular podcast, Real Talk Radio with Nicole Antoinette. Now, I've listened to this for years and have always appreciated her honesty, her forthrightness, and ability to get to the heart of a matter. In the process, you know she's going to have a really strong opinion about a topic, and that's what I love about her. She's the kind of person whom you imagine spends a lot of time giving really quality thought to pretty much everything that she does. There's no ambiguity. And as she talks about here, when she makes a decision, she makes a definitive decision. There's not a lot of wishy-washy going on. Nicole's not one to be afraid to change direction, to be influenced, at least not too much, by what people think or say. She is who she is, and she doesn't make any apologies about it. A week prior to us recording, she had returned from an 800-mile, 44-day solo hike on the Arizona Trail. So we talked about that experience, including the fears that come up with being a woman doing a seemingly scary hike like that, and also how she manages that much time away from her husband. She was pretty much offline uh, when the whole Me Too meme was at its height, but we do get into a bit of that as well. In this conversation, Nicole talks about what she observes as the reason many people are afraid to commit to a decision, and also her ongoing search for figuring out how to close the gap between saying what we want and what we actually do. Before we get to our conversation, a reminder that you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And a quick reminder to the ladies out there, please join our Be Bold Facebook group. It's our growing community of women. It's a place to share goals, talk about our setbacks, and where you can find words of encouragement and inspiration from others. We've got over 2,400 members there now. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Nicole Antoinette. My run this morning, I started running again last week. So after, I mean, obviously I just got back from the hike, but after a lot of time off of running. So it's like, it's funny how you could be really fit for one activity, which does not necessarily translate. My legs are like, what is this? What are we doing? It's so like, it seems like it wouldn't be that different from hiking, but it's so different. Yeah, it is. Cause you're using completely different muscles yeah. for it. So my legs are like, uh, question mark, question mark. What are we doing? But it went fine. It when you fine. were on the AZT was it at altitude at all? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think the highest point was just over nine thousand feet. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Okay, yeah, I it's, had higher, no idea. It's, it's different than you'd think. Yeah, Arizona, the, like the the different types of terrain that I went through. Like I, I had this picture in my head. I mean, obviously I researched before I went, but you think Arizona just sort of like flat yeah, and cactus? No, it right. was basically never flat. And yeah, it was often higher altitude. Well, we're here in Bend, Oregon. And uh, it's about 3,000 feet or so here, I Yeah, think. I think it's 34, 3,500, depends on where in the city you are. I don't, I haven't been feeling, sometimes when I go out for a run, because I went out for a little three-mile run this morning, uh, sometimes when I go out at altitude, I can really feel it, but I didn't feel it so much here, so I was grateful for that. Yeah, when I first moved here, it took me about six weeks, because this is an interesting altitude level where it's not high enough that you feel it just walking around, like running errands, right? Which if you, you know, I do feel it if I'm above, you know, 10,000 feet or something like that, I can get headaches, I can get that. And it wasn't until I went running 
you know, or you start to do something physical here that you realize, oh, wait, actually, this is not sea level because I came here from Los Angeles. And it was, yeah, it took me about six weeks to not feel like I was dying when I was running. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's talk about the AZT because that's a great place um, to start. So the Arizona Trail, Mm -hmm. you just got back a week ago (laughs) from that. Yeah. How is it settling back in? Um... How is it settling back in? It's it's good. Honestly, for me, l- since long distance hiking, backpacking is something that I'm relatively new to. It's not like something that I grew up doing. It's so different from my regular life that it almost feels like an alter ego situation where like it's another person who did that thing. Like the mental space that I have to get into to do something that's, I find it very hard to do something that's that hard alone, you know, far from home that it almost feels like it happened to somebody else. I mean, not really. I know that it happened to me. Maybe that sounds like a silly thing to say, but it's like the me who did the hiking is feels like not the me who's now at home, you know, with my husband and my cats in my normal, comfortable life. So settling back in has been relatively easy, just in that it feels like it almost <laughs> because didn't that's happen. The, because that's the natural part. Yeah. Is, be, being home is the natural part. Yeah. I also, I mean, I was excited to come home. I, last year when I did the Oregon section of the PCT, that was my first ever long distance backpacking trip. And most of the people that I met on the trail were through hikers, people that were doing, you know, the whole trail. And I was only doing a section. And it was interesting of all the people that I met that were out there. I was pretty much the only one who had a life that they love to go home to because the nature, I mean, if you're going to be, if you do the whole PCT, right, it's usually about five months. So if you're going to be able to take five months off your life, usually it's during a period of transition, you know, people maybe in their early twenties or people who have just gotten a divorce or who are retired or, work, yeah. right. Or because I mean, having that kind of flexibility and the privilege to be able to do that, you know, that's, that's pretty rare. So most people were sort of in the place of, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life after the trail. And I've heard from friends who have been in that situation that they can have a really hard time reintegrating afterwards. I think for me, it was, it's easier because that's not the case that I'm really, ex- I was excited to come back and get back to work, right. And to start recording for the podcast and to work on writing and to be with my husband and my friends here. So I think n- having things that I was excited to come home to helped. That's interesting. Cause it makes me think about just people who travel in general, how their experience is different when they take maybe uh, even just a two week trip where they take a vacation, they hold on and love that vacation so much because they're desperate to get away from that life <laughs> that's at home. And I had never thought about that before, but you bring up a really good point. I mean, that's like, it's it's like so big when you talk about taking months off or going away from months and leaving something big behind that the difference of a five month trip on the PCT and a two week vacation, but it's still there. There's still that feeling of not wanting to go back, but embracing what you're doing so much, so wholeheartedly. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I was gone for 44 days this on the Arizona trail. That's how long it took me. Um, so what, just over six weeks, which felt like a really long time. It, it got to the point where it felt like I had never not been out there and I was <laughs> never not going to be out there, you know, so it wasn't an insignificant amount of time, but I think it was very clearly not escapism for me. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with escapism, right? Like to take a, a vacation where you sort of are running away. or I mean, there's, do everyone can do what they want to do, but it wasn't that for me. So I think that helped also, that it wasn't like I did this thing because I hate my life or I hate my job or I hate my marriage. or Like it was something that I really wanted to do basically because it was hard. Like my reasons for hiking the Arizona Trail is essentially because I didn't believe that I could hike the Arizona Trail. And I tend to be quite perfectionistic and I don't like things that I'm not good at. And I think that's probably not that rare, but I don't like things that I'm not good at. And that sort of can snowball into being unwilling to try new things, you know, and, um, you know, if you have to be good at it and if you're going to be a perfectionist about it, then it holds you back a lot. And I was seeing that come up in a couple of different ways in my life and, you know, just getting too comfortable. And so I wanted to do something that I legitimately didn't think that I could do or that there was a very high probability of failure. I mean, lots of people start long distance hikes and for any number of reasons, you know, whether it's, injury or they hate it or they miss their partner or, you know, there's lots of reasons why people come off the trail. And so that it it really didn't have anything to do with 
trying to escape my life, if that makes sense. It was like a challenge that I wanted to do for really personal reasons on its own. And so I think, and I definitely got what I wanted out of it, which feels incredible, but I think all of that made coming back easier. So when you say you got all of that you wanted out of it, does that just mean having a successful trip? Um, I mean, I'm super proud of myself that I finished the trail. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to do it and sort of prove myself wrong, but it's less about completing it than I'm just like proud of who I was on the trail, meaning that it was, I expected it to be hard and it was so much harder than I thought that it was going to be. Was it more difficult than the PCT? So much. Oh my God. The, this, I, it was funny. I, I had this realization you know, about three quarters of the way into this trip that last year, I mean, because again, I only did a portion of the PCT. I did the Oregon section, which is 460 miles and is known as sort of the easiest section of the PCT. And I still thought it was incredibly hard. It was the hardest thing that I had ever really done in my life. Basically, it felt like at that point. And the comparison between the two, like the Oregon section of the PCT is an infant baby joke hike compared to Arizona. So I had this moment in Arizona of, oh, this is what growth feels like. (laughs) Because it was so hard last year and I was so miserable. And I never could have imagined doing something that was like many magnitudes more challenging. And so it was kind of this nice moment of, oh, I have gotten stronger. I've gotten tougher. Like sometimes I feel like change happens so slowly. Personal growth happens so slowly. We get stronger so slowly that we don't notice it while it's happening until it's like when it's getting dark, right? Like if you're sitting, let's say like outside at a coffee shop, you know, and it's late afternoon, early evening, and you're having a conversation with someone, it's like all of a sudden you'll realize, oh, it's dark. You know, it's like that. You just notice it. And it was this moment of, oh, I'm stronger than I used to be. And that felt really good because it was so much harder than than, than the Oregon PCT. So you did the Oregon PCT. Did you have intentions to do the Washington portion? Um, That's what I was going to do this year. Uh, That was my original plan was to do that in August. Um, But two factors, one, the really high snow levels this year, starting, you know, in like June and July, I was kind of getting freaked out because I don't have uh, snow experience yet. And I just wasn't really comfortable with that. So I had started looking into other options. And then um, the decision was kind of made for me. One of my best friends uh, is a professional runner and she made the the U.S. team for the track and field world championships in London. And so I went over to London with her. And so that was, it was kind of the same time frame that would have been in August. And so I thought, okay, let me pick, you know, a plan B hike and Arizona kind of came. There aren't that many fall hiking options, you know, in North America that are that good. And, you know, with Arizona trail, most people that do it go northbound in the spring because there's more water, but you can go southbound in the fall, which obviously is what I did. What about the Appalachian trail? Someday, maybe. Okay, I didn't know if that was on your radar as a fall trail or you could do that in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I I, I thought about it. Um, I would love, I mean, I'd love to do the whole PCT. I would love to do the whole AT. Uh, But again, I mean, that requires being in a situation where I feel good about taking five months, four to five months off my life, which currently I don't want to do that. So, I mean, that was also the, I mean, this was 800 miles at the Arizona Trail. And so, you know, figuring, given working for myself and having some flexibility, taking four to six weeks off with a lot of planning is doable. So that felt like something super challenging and within the realm of possibility, you know, what I would have to do in order to be gone for four to five months. um, I'm just not ready for that yet. Was it a difficult decision to, because you had put it out there that you were going to do the Washington portion of the PCT to then dial that back and say, nope, change of course. Um, Well, it's funny because what I wound up doing is actually harder because the Washington section is what, 500 miles and this is 800. So it didn't really feel like a, in that regard, but, but yeah, I I get your question. I, um, no, I, I, I don't really, I don't really care. I guess when people think like I, part of, if you're going to be publicly honest about your life, which I mean, in in some capacity, I have been telling honest personal stories on the internet for over a decade, you know, in different forms. Obviously I have a podcast now. I had a personal blog for eight years. You know, I've done different, lots of different variations of personal story sharing online. And the only way to do that, I think for me, is to acknowledge that not everything is going to be tied up in a bow. Like sometimes you say that you're going to do something and it doesn't always work out, right? Either, you know, you don't want to do it anymore, which is totally fine. You change your mind. Uh, Something else becomes a better fit. You know, you try and you're not able to do it. You try and fail. Like there's, you know, so part of it for me 
is just being able to be like, oh, I said, I thought that this was the thing I was going to do. And actually it's not. And here are the reasons. And I think that that's, I don't know, that's valuable also to not have everything always be like picture perfect. Is that a quick decision for you? Or does it, is there tension involved or is there time involved where you say, oh gosh, I'm, I've been following the weather forecast for weeks and I, and cause, because I know that there's a transition time when people have to make a decision or make a change. There's that transition time. So for you, was it weeks as you were looking at the weather forecast and, and you were kind of feeling like, oh, I may not be able to do this? Um, or was it just like, oh gosh, like I you know, I just started paying attention to it. And overnight, I realized, yeah, I can't do I can't do it. And I need to make the decision like super fast. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in that too, how people make decisions. Um, Well, we had, a. I mean, I think there was high snow everywhere, right? Like we had a ton of snow here in Bend, like it was it was nuts last winter. So I was definitely aware of the fact that we were in a significant winter. When was it that I started to think about it? I think it was probably mid-June, yeah, I started looking at um, sort of the, just some of the different weather stations, like the key weather stations in Washington in, near the PCT and saw how, you know, some of them were you know, over 200% of regular snow levels, like insane amounts, right? And so it was on, once I started paying attention to that, it was on my radar as, huh, this doesn't feel safe for me. I'm going to, I think I said, I'm going to watch it for a couple of weeks and just see. And I don't like what, how do I want to say this? The process of, in, like, I don't like indecision. That's one of my least favorite. Like when I feel like I have a decision to make, that sort of decision-making fatigue feeling is incredibly exhausting for me. So it got to the point, I think only a couple of weeks went by and I realized that I wasn't going to know what the snow condition, because the snow conditions were still bad then but there was a there was a good chance that they would be better by August but it would I wouldn't know until August and like that period of feeling like I don't know what I'm doing I don't know what I'm planning for for so long didn't feel good to me so like I I don't know if this is making sense but that I I realized that I was either going to have to sort of just wing it at the last minute with Washington or make like pull the plug like, earlier yeah, which and then I it's not like I was so committed to that I hadn't invested any like resources in it. Why not do a different hike? Right. Like it was, there was no reason I wasn't like married to the idea of doing Washington, you know? You know what I realized about this is that because you record your podcasts in batches that I think I had heard. And I, and so it's just like me kind of watching you and kind of the progress. I had heard that you were doing the Washington portion of the trip. And then suddenly, like quote unquote, suddenly, the next thing I knew you were doing the AZT. And so I thought, oh, she must have done both of them this year, Hmm. because I missed the transition somewhere, just because I missed the blog post, or I missed the podcast. Yeah, I think I talked about it on Instagram a little bit. But um, as I was trying to make the decision. Yeah, yes, yes. So that's so it's the perception of of a just a regular person like me observing you and kind of not knowing like hey what happened i don't like like what was going on in the background i don't mm-hmm. know but you know what it doesn't matter because right. it's just me right it's like who cares you're the one making the decision you're the one who's living the life sure but i was i just realized as i'm thinking this through and asking you that question it's like oh i see so for me it totally came out of left field because i missed that time on Instagram when you mentioned the change. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, huh, 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 like what happened? But it's, it's just kind of a, a funny phenomenon. I think when you're, when you know, when you quote unquote, know someone, you know, and not in real life, you don't see the transition happening, you know, and it's there slowly taking place. Yeah. I mean, I'm a quick decision maker in general. So I think like I, I don't have a hard time even making big decisions or big changes or just, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like that's always been true for me. I tend not to agonize over things that, you know, even that couple of weeks of like, am I going to do this? Am I not going to, like, that's so uncomfortable for me that I would rather just, all right, screw it. I'm going to do this other thing. So instead. how do you make that decision? Because I understand that feeling of making a quick decision because I'm that way too. And I think from the outside, people say, wow, like, where did that come from? For me, there is that internal, whether it's research or there's just something going on in the back of my mind thinking, ah, this doesn't quite feel right. I'm going to make this change. It might appear to people that it's really fast. So for you, it's not one minute to the next. 
I'm assuming, like nobody does that. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Is there is there research involved, or is there there's got to be a period of some kind of internal research or questioning before you do make a decision? I mean, I think it depends on the decision, right? Like some things require research and some things don't, <laughs> right? So I, I mean, I guess it depends on what we're talking about. But I just, this is one of those hard questions to answer because when something's like so intrinsically part of who you are, it's hard to sort of parse out what what your process is, right? Like people who are just naturally cheerful. I don't know that they like sit around and think about like how to be cheerful, right? So like part of this for me is like, I don't really know because I have I don't have an experience of not being this way. I think I'm not afraid to make commitments because I'm not afraid to change my mind. Um, so I think like part of what people struggle with in making a decision has to do with sort of what other people will think or what will happen if something changes. Like I'm comfortable with change. I think that that's like really the heart of it is like I accept the fact that we're not robots and what you want today might not be what you want five years, five months, maybe even five days, five hours from now, right? Like that. So I'm okay with that. So I don't feel like if I publicly say that I'm going to do one thing and, you know, the natural course of life means that that doesn't come to fruition for whatever reason, I don't feel like that's like a personal failing, <laughs> you know? So I think that that's sort of baked into the process. But um, I mean, this is the, I mean, the the which hike to do question is, I guess, a good example to, to answer what you asked in that um, there was research in terms of looking at the snow information, right? And then sort of doing research on statistical snow levels in the past and what that actually looked like, because it's one thing to like read a number of this many inches of snow, but I don't actually know, okay, what does that mean in terms of hiking conditions, you know? And so it was doing some research, talking to two friends who are very experienced through hikers just to sort of get their opinion on it and then doing research on what are some other potential you know recommended fall hikes and um, essentially I was looking at the long trail you know in Vermont the Superior Hiking Trail in Minnesota and the Arizona Trail and you know sort of quickly decided not to go all the way to the east coast because it felt like a long time to travel for essentially 200 miles and then um minnesota the the superior hiking trail sort of the same thing it's a 300 mile trail and i thought to get on a plane and do all that to only be gone for three weeks like it just didn't really seem worth it and um if i'm being honest part of a decision making process for me is of a couple of different options there's always one that gets under my skin more than others i think this is probably true for most people there was something about the difficulty of the Arizona trail that I couldn't really shake. Like even though the, that made it more appealing. For yes. You? Okay. Yeah. There was something like that. My, my gut feeling was, this is what I want to do. And then, uh, you know, essentially I spent a couple of weeks almost trying to talk myself out of it. I emailed the Arizona trail association just to get their advice on being a relatively new hiker and doing such a hard trail at this time of year. I mean, in the email they sent me back was actually very terrifying. Honestly, it was like, don't do this unless you're super experienced and there's basically no water. And I mean, I and think you said, just, I'm going to do that. Basically. Now. <laughs> I mean, I think sort of it, they're like trying to cover their ass you yeah, know, a little bit, but, um, which is fine. But if like in, I think in our quiet moments, we, if we're willing to be honest with ourselves, we know the thing that we want to do then there's just like a lot of other noise and nonsense. Like we don't believe in ourselves enough or we don't know how to make it happen. We don't know how to close the gap between this thing that we want and what our life currently is. But it's often not, at least for me, it's not an issue of not knowing the one that I want to pick. It's working out all of the other stuff. So, you know, eventually one day I just got so also making decisions for me it often gets to the point where I just get sick of myself. Like I get sick of the going back and forth. And I mean, I was at a coffee shop one day and I was like, I I'm done with this. And I bought a one-way ticket to Arizona. <laughs> I was like, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, so. What advice would you give or how, how do you do it yourself? How do you close the gap? What do you mean? Well, you use the term close the gap in terms of making the, like kind of knowing internally what you want to do, but not being able to actually do it. I wish I had an easy answer for you on this. I feel like this is my like life's obsession is this idea of how do we close the gap between what we say we want and what we actually do, right? I mean, and if, if I had an answer to that, I would be a gazillionaire <laughs> because I think that this is in many different forms of life, the overarching question, right? You know, how we say that we want to get up early to spend, you know, an hour writing before we have to go to work and then why is it so hard to make that happen? Or, you know, you use the example of... um 
uh, when we were talking, I think before we started recording about, you said you wanted to run a marathon and then you just did that. And that's like, there's so many things that we say we want to do, but the gap is really big. I mean, and so I think for me, how to close that gap. Um, this could be a whole long conversation uh, on its own, but I think a lot of it is looking at and being honest about what lives in that gap, like what makes up the gap. So am I not like for the Arizona trail, for example, so we can just keep using this because it's an easy one. You know, before I committed to it, I knew that that was the trail that I wanted to attempt. And so it was asking myself, basically like what's holding me back? Like what are the reasons that I am hesitant to do this? And the biggest one was that I didn't think that I could do it. I didn't believe in myself enough. Um, I was scared of a lot of logistical things. There's not very much water that time of year. It's incredibly remote. I wasn't confident in my ability to just be that alone. Um, so it's like, I think closing- But you had been that alone on the Oregon PCT. I did it alone, but it's a very well-traveled trail. And at the height of through hiker season, I mean, you would see 10 people a day. You know, you met, I mean, on, in, on the Arizona trail, there were two, three, four days where I didn't see another human which I had never experienced in my life. So, I mean, this idea of like, how do we close the gap? I think we can't do it unless we're like brutally honest with ourselves about why, about why we're not doing the thing, right? Like, is it, uh, I mean, I don't even know. It's we're afraid to fail or we're not willing to be uncomfortable or, you know, there, there's, I mean, it's just looking, I think for each different situation and different people, it's like starting to, I don't know, get to be honest with yourself about those things. And then are you willing to tackle them? Do you journal to like peel back the layers? Or I would like to say that I do. I Journaling has been one of those things, sort of like meditation, that like seems like a really good idea. Mm. I know people that have very successful practices with it. Um, and I can't tell you how many half or quarter filled journals have existed in like my, my past is littered with like journals that have 20 pages filled out. Mm. Um, for whatever reason, it's never stuck for me. Um, however, public writing does stick. Mm. So I, it's like, I think about a lot of the work that I do. Essentially it is a public journal really. Like I, I write a weekly email series called notes of grit and grace for the people who support my podcast. And that's essentially, like I blogged for eight years. Right. And when I was done with that and deleted the whole blog, basically bur I'm a burn it to the ground person. Like when I'm done, I'm done. And people couldn't believe that, you know, this is like your eight years worth of work. And it was just like deleted one day. <laughs> so like um, literally deleted, literally deleted. Yeah. And so, you know, and from there, then I wound up doing weekly emails Then it became like this exclusive weekly email. So it's like in different iterations, I have written publicly basically at least once a week for almost a decade. And that's sort of, it's, I know it's not the same as journaling, but it serves the same function for me. Like I feel oftentimes that I don't understand myself or know myself until I've written about it. Like there's something that's very eye-opening and like cathartic for me. And for whatever reason, I can't get myself to do that if it's just for me. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I understand the value of journaling because I do it for myself, but it it's um, like you obviously don't have any problem processing <laughs> and kind of right. thinking about things. And I can see the value for you to process it publicly and get it out there in some form. For me, I don't do it publicly, but I have a journal. And for me, it's so important. I do sit down. I I get up in the morning, I meditate, and then I journal, and I sit down. And when I see those words kind of reinforced day after day, sometimes I write the exact same things mm -hmm. or very close to the same thing day after day. When I do that, then it starts to sink in. And I have something to reference back later in the day and say, oh, okay, like, does this fall into like kind of my commitment, my morning commitment of how my day is going to play out? That works for me. And I can see how you, like that, it helps to reinforce it for me, but you, it doesn't seem like you need that reinforcement because your, your mind is going in such a way that you're thinking about things constantly and then you can retain them. And that's, that's the key is for me, I can't retain it until I write it down. No, I mean, I, yeah, I get that. I, I agree that I have no trouble processing. That's like, again, that's my default state is like to be introspective and to process things. I think I'm good at asking myself poignant, often hard questions. So while I don't necessarily have a journaling practice, I'm certainly no stranger to going to the coffee shop with a blank piece of paper and like writing a good question at the top and doing a brain dump. It's more that I don't 
keep those pages really like it's the act of you know like I'll, I'll do for sure like brain dumps list mate I mean no one likes list making more than I do right like that I'll do all of that type of stuff um, but in terms of actually you know more thought out there's there's something about knowing that other people are going to read it that makes me that sort of forces me to be more coherent, which essentially then just benefits me. The fact that other people are reading it isn't really what it's about. Like I'm not doing it for approval or validation necessarily. It's that process of this is going to be in front of someone else's eyes. So I have to put it in a way that makes sense, helps me to make sense of my own feelings. So for whatever reason, like that has, it's why I can't, I, even once I quit blogging, I just can't quit this like public writing in some form. And it was funny when I was on the hike, I did daily posts on Instagram that were essentially like little mini blog posts. And I, you get sort of two schools of thought, you know, people that think that social media is like ruining the outdoor experience because you're not really in your experience if you're posting about it, which sure, I guess, you know, if people feel that way, then they certainly don't have to use social media while they're out there. But I feel the complete opposite, like the, you know, 20 to 40 minutes in my tent every night when I would write the captions for Instagram, like that was so helpful for me to process like my own feelings and to like put a pin in the day and to like really understand how I was feeling and to keep a record of what had happened that I found that my experience on the trail was greatly, you know, elevated by the commitment to do public writing. So before we get off the path, literally, of the uh, of the AZT, tell me what a typical day was like for you on that. For people, like I've done some big treks myself, so I kind of know how that, how that works. But for people who can't even imagine what a through hike is, like explain what a typical day is like. Yeah. I mean, again, I think it's, it would be sort of different on different trails, um, depending upon seeing other people or not like that's a huge factor and depending upon whether you're alone or not um but for me it was mostly getting up I mean I don't sleep that well on trails basically it's like sleep deprived for like 44 days but so I would usually be up anyway but trying to get on trail around first light which in the fall um I was actually that was one of the biggest challenges was how little daylight there is and I don't like hiking in the dark so you know, I would start hiking anywhere between 6 and 7 a.m., depending upon, you know, where in the season it was, or if I was coming out of town or in my tent or whatever, Um, you know, so get everything packed up in, you know, in my bag. And then honestly, mostly just hike all day. It's one of the, I mentioned the daylight thing, you know, when you're hiking during the summer and it doesn't get dark until 8.30 or 9, you have quite a bit more time to play with. Um, But I constantly felt low grade anxiety about sort of like racing the sun, mm-hmm. you know, that I would have loved to take, you know, an hour and a half lunch break or do that. But I mean, there, I just couldn't and cover the miles that I needed to cover. Basically with the Arizona trail, the hardest parts are, it's incredibly rocky. So, you know, you're not necessarily, it's not like the PCT or like really well-groomed trails where you can kind of just walk. Like it's, it was insane just how rocky it was. And, um, was the path obvious in, A lot of places, yes, in certain places, no. But either way, it was just lots of rocks. It's really rough terrain and um, very scarce water, particularly this time of year. So it would often be, you know, 20 plus miles between water sources. So your essentially entire day is planned around water and sunset for me. Um, Again, I'm going to have a headlamp. I did night hike a couple times, but I really don't like it. You didn't mean to. (laughs) Yeah, basically. And, um, you know, when the trail's that rocky, I was just afraid I was going to twist my ankle or fall or something, you know, I, and I was spooked and alone yeah. and didn't want to hike in the dark. Um, so essentially the whole day is planned around, okay, well, it's 22 miles till the next water source. I have to go that far and I want to go that far before it gets dark. So it's basically just covering miles as best as I can. So it's mostly just walk all day, take short breaks, you know, when you come to water, filter water, when it's, you know, 5.30 p.m. and I would start to freak out about where I'm, um, I have to find a flat place to camp and where am I going to, you know, I would have like the 5.15, 5.30 p.m. panic every single day without fail and then set up my tent, get in my tent, attempt to sleep like that basically what about food? every day. What, what, like what are you eating for breakfast and snacking on and lunch and dinner? Um, 
yeah, I mean, it's, I don't really think about like meals necessarily out there. It's all just mostly the same, right? That it's not like, okay, this is breakfast. This is this. It's mostly just eat when you're hungry, which is all the time. So Um, you're not having like, you're not making oatmeal in the morning. No, not, I mean, and some people do. I didn't bring a stove. So um, it was mostly a combination of uh, bars, you know, picky bars are my favorites. Um, But I brought a couple different kinds of bars, you know, nuts, trail mix, that type of stuff you know for six weeks chips um <laughs> yeah uh I brought um granola that I wound up hating um you know bread some people like tortillas nut butter like that kind of thing are there drop spots where you pick up food along the way mm-hmm. yeah and then sort of my like highest calorie meal of the day I um I had like a screw top container that I could cold soak things in so basically that you just re things that you rehydrate just with water that you don't need heat for so I brought dehydrated refried beans you know that I had essentially seasoned with taco seasoning at home freeze-dried spinach and peas and basically you just like you know pour water in that and it rehydrates and then I would add olive oil um, because you're always looking for Mm, basically as many calories as you can get you know Um, and you know a ton of tortilla chips and that was mostly my I mean I guess you could call it dinner you know that I would eat in the late afternoon yeah, just trying to keep food as easy and like not time consuming as possible. How many drop spots were there for food? Um, I did, well, so I did all of my resupplies by mail. You know, some people will, you know, go to grocery stores or whatever along the way, but I'm mostly vegan. So I fi- just found it easier to package all the food up at home. And then, you know, my husband sent me my boxes. Um, I did 11 stops. Uh, oh, so. wow. A bit over 800 miles. Yeah. You know? So every few days, four days or so. Every, yeah, it depends on what it was. It was every two to five days, two to six days. Yeah. Something like that, depending upon, you know, how far apart the towns were. And yeah, I think my longest stretch was five and a half days. I, um, you mentioning that you're vegan. I just remember on your Instagram, you say you're 96% vegan. Yes. I say I'm 95% See? <laughs> yeah, vegan there you on go. my Instagram. Yeah. yeah. So, cause you know, sometimes a croissant has to pass these lips, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's, it's funny. I be, I thought about that a lot on the hike too, just about like labels and how attached we get to certain identities. And the thing, I mean, with veganism, I'm careful even using that word because I mean, words mean things and I'm very clear of what it means to be a true strict vegan. And, you know, backpacking is a great example. I have a down sleeping bag and I have a down jacket and those were choices. And leather boots or, I mean, maybe not. I mean, but, that, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it was a real, cause I hadn't purchased anything that had, you know, been made of or from animal products in basically since I first transitioned into being plant-based in July of 2012. So it was when I got into backpacking, it was actually a huge decision for me of, am I going to buy, you know, there are of course, synthetic sleeping bags and other options. And it was entirely a selfish choice that the warmth to weight ratio it is better. And, you know, so you do the best you can in terms of finding companies that are hopefully more ethically sourced than others, but I'm certainly under no, you know, like false belief that that's not still an animal product and that that was a selfish choice that I made. And so once I made that choice, I'm also not so concerned about eating honey. And so I can't actually call myself vegan. And there were a couple of times uh, in towns along the trail where I would have waffles or something, you know, that I know um, probably have, I had eggs, have oh, yeah, milk. milk or eggs in the batter. And um, I'm fine with that. You know, I, for me, I feel like what I do most of the time matters more than what I only do once in a while. I know some people are real strict purists about it, and I totally respect that. Yeah, but I think like anything, you have to be confident in your own decisions. And I don't feel like I have to justify it, right? Like there will be some people who are strict vegans who don't agree with what I'm doing. And that's that's fine, right? you know? Um, and so like anything else, you know, we were talking before about making change or making big decision decisions, the end of the day, like you have to go to sleep with yourself. Like you're, you have to be in integrity with your own decisions and there will always be people who don't agree. And that sounds like such a cliche thing and, you know, but it's cliche for a reason. Right. It doesn't matter what you do. There's always, there's going to be detractors. Yeah. And I, I mean, just getting really clear on making decisions and commitments that feel good to you first and foremost. And, you know, maybe you do have to get your friends and family on board for certain things. And it's not, you know, we don't live in a vacuum completely alone, but you know, when I would go into a trail town, I'd be like, no, I'm going to order these waffles. I felt a hundred percent fine with that. And that's 
what matters, right. you know? Right. Yep. And we're all, you know, we're a work in progress too. And my transition into being mostly vegan, you know, has come over time. You know, it's not, wasn't, wasn't it just a quick thing. I've been vegetarian, well, pescatarian before pescatarian was a term, right? So pescatarian since like 1990. And then I took out the fish when I realized, oh, I can actually eat vegetarian without, you know, having fish and I can still get protein because that's like the big thing that everyone's worried about. And then, then I realized I didn't have to have even eggs or dairy and that I actually felt better mm -hmm. through that process. But I'm not so strict that if I go to someone's house and they make lasagna thinking they're doing this great thing by having a vegetarian meal for me, I'm not going to turn it down mm -hmm. either. So it's like you said, it's like yeah, at the everyone, end of the day. Everyone has to make their own choices, you know, yeah. with everything. And I think, you know, we really have this fetish for the sort of like before and after story, like the all or nothing situation sure like sometimes maybe that makes like good Instagram posts or like good you know whatever but I think that real life is a lot more complicated than that I think it's a lot more nuanced and I think that if we tell ourselves that the only way to do something is to is to do all or nothing that I mean again going back to the like how do you close the gap between what you say you want and what you actually do well first of all is the thing that you say you want even realistic and I'm not saying that being vegan isn't realistic of course it is right but for let's say using that as an example for someone who's interested potentially in like eating a more plant-based diet for any number of reasons. And if they see, and that's not how they're currently living, and if they see the only option as being 100% or nothing, that's really intimidating. And I think that doesn't do anyone any favors. Like that it does, like the incremental change or progress or, you know, like slowly moving the chains down the field, it's not as sexy as the like, then I just quit everything overnight. And now this is my, you know, whatever magazine cover story situation. Like it's not as sexy, but it's way more effective. And I think that and it's far closer to the truth. Too. Exactly. And so I also think that there, we need to like give ourselves and each other like grace and permission to change and change slowly and to change in a messy way mm -hmm. that it's not, I don't know, that I have a lot of strong feelings about this, that it's like as soon as we make it, like you have to always do this. Like I think about this, I'm one of my big creative goals, you know, for next year is to write a book about the Arizona trail hike. And, you know, even this idea, if I tell myself, okay, I'm going to write a thousand words every single day, it's going to be the first thing that I do in the morning. Like maybe that winds up being my ideal that my like compass is pointed in that direction. But I'm telling you right now, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There's going to be a day where, you know, I want to have sex with my husband in the morning and not get up and write first thing in the, you know, like that it's yeah. not going to be the first thing that I do or whatever you want a day off or you, you know, anything. And that that has to be okay. That it's like, I've found through making a lot of pretty, I guess, like significant life changes over the last, you know, six to eight years that again, this like what you do most of the time matters way more than what you only do once in a while. And what matters for me isn't so much if I, I don't even want to say mess up because that's not even like the right words, but that, you know, let's say I, I do write, you know, 20 days in a row, for example. And then, you know, I, I don't write for two days. It's less about not writing for those two days, the question for me becomes like, how quickly can I pick it back up again? Like have it not be a big deal to be like, okay, I didn't write for those two days and now I'm just going to keep going again, as opposed to letting six months go by where I beat myself up about how I didn't do it every day, right? It's being able to just keep going and not make everything such a big deal and just like pick it back up. And so I think this was that maybe that's the answer that I like couldn't articulate before about like, how do you close the gap between what you say you want and what you actually do? It's like, first of all, like giving yourself more grace and like, accepting that the process is like often way messier than you want it to be. Like it's going to be way messier than someone's like 10 step life hack productivity advice blog post, right? Like all that stuff sounds nice, but. <laughs> yeah. And it's showing up on a regular basis though, too, that's important because sometimes just like in my training for running, you know, there might be a day where like this happened to me like two weeks ago, it was snowing like crazy. And I'm like, I'm looking at my weather app and it's like, no, like there's no snow in the forecast. And I'm looking out and it is snowing and just it's a it's a cold, wet snow, like really uncomfortable. So I like got all dressed and I and I'm outside and I like I went about I went a, like a quarter mile and I'm like, I cannot do this. Like my toes are going to freeze because I had an 18 mile run that day. And I'm like, I'm going to freeze. So I went back home and then I'm sitting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the snow to go away because it's still not even on the weather map that it's supposed to be snowing. I'm like, come on. And uh, I'm 
kind of in a way beating myself up a little bit. I'm like, what does this mean if I don't go for my run today? Did I fail because I haven't, because it's on my schedule, I need to do this big training run because I've got a marathon coming up. So what, what does this mean if I don't do it? Like, does everything fall apart? And I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky is that we think that we have to be super strict. And I think it happens a lot with diets too. It's like, I've got to be super strict with my diet because if I fall off the wagon a little bit, then all hell's going to break loose. But we have to give ourselves, like you said, the grace to, and the permission to, to, to fall off a little bit, but to know that if we get back on for those 20 days of writing or tomorrow I do the 18 miler or kind of figure it out, then we can be much happier. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think, again, there's like a a very sexy cultural narrative about like, always finding a way, no excuses, never give up. And I think it's a both and like I so I mentioned I write this weekly email series called Notes of Grit and Grace. And this idea of trying to live with both grit and grace, like that's sort of an overarching philosophy for me, because it's essentially what we're talking about. This idea of grit is like, yeah, like I don't give up. I do it even when I'm not in the mood to do it. Like the I had a lot of grit in terms of finishing the Arizona trail, right? This idea that you don't have to be in the mood to do something in order to do it. And it can be hard and you can still do it and sort of like toughen up and make it happen and like push through and all of that. And also the grace piece, like what we're talking about, that sometimes things are out of your control or sometimes, you know, you're just not going to do it. And for- Or you have to cancel the Washington portion of the PCT right. and make other plans. Exactly. And so it's not, I don't think it's not an either or, it's a both and because the extremes of- grit and grace are not helpful because I felt like the, for me, when I think of like the extremes of, of grit, it's, you know, in the marathon example, it's, you know, potentially overtraining and getting an injury or running in conditions that really aren't safe. Right. That's what I felt like. Exactly. And, or, and the uh, taking it too far on the grace side for me is almost like letting myself off the hook too much. Right. Where it's like, if you're really, again, it comes back to brutal honesty. Like I feel like you have to just on a regular basis or what works for me is sort of cultivating this habit of like being brutally honest with myself. Like I know the difference between I'm not going to go for this run because the conditions aren't safe and I'm not going to go for this run because I'm just like feeling lazy and I don't want to. And not that that's not a reason to take a break sometimes too. Like it's Mm, not, but it's, you know the difference. Like, you know when you're like trying to pull one over on yourself, right? And even that, it's like, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make, do anything differently, but just being able to be like, yeah, I'm just really being lazy. Like there's, I think that there's a lot of value in honesty, like essentially with no agenda. Like just tell the truth to yourself, even to no one else. Like just be able to tell yourself the truth about who you are, like that. And it's not always pretty. And like, sometimes there's a lot of shame involved, but sometimes, you know, or or rather I'd say all the time, I think that it's beneficial just to like get in the habit of just being honest with yourself, you know? You know, I know that you've talked about change a lot. And one thing that comes up and kind of, uh, this is a transition from what you just said. Uh, This is gonna be a long winded way for me to say it. So you've talked about change. And you've talked about sometimes change doesn't happen until you find that pain point, And then it kind of forces you into that change. And I have always thought, like for myself, I make changes and I challenge myself, but I don't feel like I hit, like, I don't hit bottom in order to do that. I just, I I just know that like, I, I want to challenge myself with a marathon or I want to do some big trek and and challenge myself. And it doesn't mean that I'm running away from something or mm-hmm. that, that I have this big pain point to go running towards something else. But then I think, am I just not challenging myself enough? <laughs> like, because I'm not feeling the pain. And am I just kind of coasting along? Whereas some people might look at me and say, oh my gosh, Beth does like all these brave, adventurous things. And I'm thinking, ah, they don't really feel that brave and adventurous. They're just things that I do, like there's challenge to it. And so then I wonder, am I not challenging myself enough? Hmm. What would you say to that? Like, am I so in touch with myself that I can go do these brave things and, and, it, and it doesn't come to a pain point? Or am I not examining myself enough and saying, where is that pain point? And what can I do to get myself out of it or to, to have more growth? 
Yeah, no, that's an interesting topic. Essentially, I think it's potentially two different conversations. Like what you referenced about the pain point uh, specifically that I've mentioned in the past that yeah, I I think there's a couple of different kinds of changes. I think there's changes. So for example, earlier this week, I went and tried indoor rock climbing for the first time. I'm terrified of heights, never done it before, have no fingertip or upper body strength. Like it, just, I mean, I made it barely halfway up the easiest, like there were like little kids like running up the wall <laughs> around me and I was like almost crying, right? So that doing that was essentially like a change of activity. There wasn't like a pain point that got me there. It was just, oh, you know, this, maybe I'll do this. This sounds interesting. I'm trying to, you know, coming back from this hike, trying to just like broaden my horizons a little bit. And even as I get back into running to also just try some other stuff. Like basically I came back from Arizona and I was like, well, I didn't die in the desert. So like I'm badass and I could probably try some other things that are scary, but there wasn't like pain involved in doing that. Um, the pain element, I think of that more in terms of, you know, I would say everyone has, and I guess this is just maybe being presumptuous, but probably at least one thing that when we go back to what we were talking about, about, you know, closing the gap between what we say we want, what we actually do, like one thing that like weighs on you that you're like every year, this is your new year's resolution. Or, you know, I use writing a book for an example. I've wanted to write a book since I knew what a book was. Have I written a book? No. So like, there's obviously something there, you know, it was the same thing for me when I quit drinking that, the, the like really big changes, big in the way that there's like a lot of emotional baggage or like there's like emotional hooks that are like really deep in you. In those types of situations, I could spend, you know, days, weeks, months, years complaining about what's wrong with me that I can't make this change. I keep saying that I want to make this change. Those types of things for me, I tend not to be able to actually change until, like you mentioned, the pain of not changing outweighs whatever my fears of changing are. So I think there, it's like different. Like you can, I, I mean, I can make little changes or things that don't, it's like where, it's looking at like where the emotional heat is, like where the hot spots are. And those things that are really emotionally charged for any number of reasons, I personally have tried to, you know, bully or force myself into changing many times. And it just, it won't work until I'm in so much pain that, and it doesn't have to be rock bottom. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know how you define rock bottom, but. Well, talk about your quitting drinking. Did you hit rock bottom? No. I mean, I, I didn't like wake up in a gutter and like didn't remember the last three days you know or anything like what I think people would again consider especially when you're talking about alcohol or something you know a rock bottom it just got to the point where and I've been thinking about this I've been thinking about sobriety a lot lately but it just got to the point where it wasn't serving me at all I mean I guess that's and you had some awareness or moment of awareness around that I mean I think I had a lot of moments of awareness again like if we're willing to be honest with ourselves like we know we know what we're doing, right? Like I'm aware when I like lay on the floor and, you know, eat a million cookies and binge watch Grey's Anatomy that like that's not coming from like necessarily the healthiest emotional place, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it, but like we know. So, oh yeah, I was aware for a while that the, I mean, and this again could be a much larger conversation, but um, that my drinking behaviors weren't, good for me. I mean, and at this point I would argue that, I mean, alcohol is a drug. It's not good for anyone, right? Like right. that there's, I mean, that could be a whole other thing, but you know, the, the amount that I was drinking was unfortunately very normalized by the people that I was hanging out with. And like, we live in a binge drinking culture and you know, that there's, it's like, I mean, you look at all of the like memes or whatever about wine and like with women and like there's so much problematic stuff that happens just in terms of like how our alcohol is marketed to women. And these are things that I've sort of woken up to in the last like couple of years since, I mean, I quit drinking, what, six and a half years ago. But yeah, that it was just, yeah, it had gotten to the point where I, yeah, like the person that I was when I was drinking, I was just in too much pain. You may have lost the second thought, but you said there were two thoughts around the pain point the, what I was talking about with the pain point and hitting rock bottom and before you making a change and then me challenging myself mm -hmm. of am I, am I challenging myself enough in terms of what I do? Because it comes easy to me. Well, so, but I mean, the, I guess like pushback question to that is what does that even mean to be challenging yourself enough? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, good question. 
like on whose standards, right? Like, cause even, but, I, and I say that almost rhetorically because these are the types of ways I think that we get stuck. Like, am I whatever enough, whatever that means, right? Like, am I being tough enough, strong enough? Am I making enough money? Am I this enough, whatever, like th- based on what? Well, based on the fact that I think my life is pretty darn good. Like I am in the scheme of things, I am pretty darn happy. I don't have really a complaint. I love to run. I find joy in it. I love to do these big treks. Yeah, they're difficult, but I don't dread each day. Like to me, having that little bit of a challenge is a great thing, like to get out there and to go for a run in the snow this morning was like, was fabulous here in Bend. And, and I'm just, I find a lot of gratitude in, in so many things. And I just think like, should things be more difficult? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think you're raising a great question because I mean, and again, I have no answer, but that we're sort of taught to believe that the only things that are worthwhile are the things that we have to suffer for, right? This kind of like, you know, e true Hollywood story. I ate ramen for 10 years and, you know, slept in the basement and it like the, the, that, those are the stories that we really hold up on a pedestal. And I think it's too, it does us a disservice Mm. because if we're taught that it's, you know, this, it's the struggle, it's the whatever, then we really, I mean, particularly as women, I think that we undervalue our natural gifts and abilities. We undervalue, you know, the experiences that maybe do come more easily, even if they are challenging. Right. And so and it's like, it's, it's always, inter- I do the same thing. I mean, I think a lot of us do. I mean, so obviously I have no answer that like the, the, the sort of questions, if I were thinking, if I were asking myself, like the things that you are asking yourself, sort of, I feel like my internal dialogue would be, okay, first of all, how much of this is actually coming from me versus like how much of this is coming from some external force? Meaning like, do you want to have the experience of doing something that maybe you aren't as good at and that does feel more of a struggle? Or do you think that you should do that, right? Like anytime we get into that, do you actually want it or do you just think that you should want it? Because those aren't the same, right? And pursuing something that we think that we should want, believe me, I've been there, like eventually you're going to quit or you're going to do it and it's going to feel really empty. And, you know, that was for me, I, the best example of that April ish, March, April, um, 2015, I was training for what was going to be my first ultra marathon and I was miserable. <laughs> and I mean, I let this go on for a while. Cause had it, you done a marathon before? Yes. I, okay. had, I, yeah, I had done marathons before. And, um, I just felt like, oh, this is the next thing, right? This is what I should be doing or whatever. I let it go on for about six weeks because, Again, like I'm a very big believer in you don't have to be in the mood to do something in order to do it. And I've had plenty of days where I wasn't in the mood to run and you go run anyway. Like I do, it's more like I I don't give a lot of weight to my feelings in the moment, but I do chart them over time. So, you know, when I had that first day of like, oh, I really don't want to do this. I'm not excited about this. It's just like a little mental note. Okay, Nicole, like, okay. And then if I'm still feeling that way a week from then, two weeks from then through, okay, then there's something, there's right, something there, right. right? And so it had been about six weeks and I was completely miserable. And like physically I was really strong and I felt fine. And I was out on what was supposed to be a two hour trail run. And I was a little over halfway into it, right? So I was like pretty far from my car and I was so miserable and I just stopped and I literally like burst into tears on the side of the trail. I'm like, what is going on? And I asked myself the question. I said, okay, Nicole, if you couldn't put a photo from the finish line of this ultra marathon on Instagram, would you still do this race? And it was such a clear no that I was like, okay, you're done. And I literally walked all the way back to my car and I wound up taking like a six month break from running, which is like, I guess like kind of a dramatic thing. But, and again, there's nothing wrong with, like I said before, like Instagram and having social media and being able to do that writing and sharing was super helpful for me in Arizona. But that's because I would have done it anyway. It's like, for me, I have to pick goals that are, fulfilling like that the the pursuit of it is fulfilling enough for me on a day-to-day basis and then the sharing it is just like an extra bonus or like a way to help me process right, or exactly. whatever it's not like but when I was real clear about oh I'm doing this because like I want people to think awesome things about me I want you know I feel like I should be an ultra marathon there was just or like a you lot told of stuff. people that you were going to do it yeah. so now you feel like you have to do exactly it. and um I mean so that's like sort of a, a a roundabout way to answer that question but this you know thing that you're thinking about or like struggling of, am I challenging myself enough? I don't know. Like, I don't even know what that means. It's, you know, it's more, I think it's more interesting. The question of like, 
is there something specific that you do want to pursue that for whatever reason you're not because it feels too challenging or like, you know, like starting to get into the specifics because I don't think there's ever going to be an accurate answer to am I blank enough? I well, don't that, know. That happens to me all the time though. Like I think when I, that's why I'm interested in decision-making processes because so last year over Thanksgiving, I ran, so I, I ran my first marathon at 50 and that was like, the, uh, that was something I said that I could never do, run a marathon. So I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how to run a marathon. So I ran my first marathon about two weeks after I turned 50. I ran, ended up running five marathons in that calendar year. And so over Thanksgiving, I ran an ultra. It was 50K on Saturday. And then I ran a marathon on Sunday. So I did two back to back. And that was because I couldn't find a 50 miler road race that I wanted to do that fit with my travel schedule. So I figured, okay, I could do, have a little bit of recovery in between and do the two. And, you know, you know, of course, in the midst of it, you're thinking, I'll never do this again. This is the stupidest thing ever. On the 50K, I thought that. The marathon the next day, I was like, just powerhouse, had a great time. But I just thought that was the stupidest thing afterwards, like two marathons in a row. Over Thanksgiving, coming up next week, and this will probably air after after Thanksgiving, but over Thanksgiving, I'm going to run four marathons. I'm going to do a quadzilla. I'm going to do nice. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday marathons. And immediately after, or just like when an idea first comes to me, I think, that's crazy. That's not for me. Ultra endurance athletes do that. Or that's for someone else. That's not for me. And then I warm up to the idea. And it might take me a long time. It might take me weeks or it might take me months or a year to warm up to an idea. But then when I finally do, I'm like, I'm all in. Like, of course I'm going to do this. And then people on the outside are like, are you crazy? Like that is, I just got an email this morning from a friend who said like, are you crazy? Are you really doing four marathons over four days? And I'm like, yeah, like to me now, because I'm so set with it, it doesn't seem crazy. And so that's where I think like, well, maybe I should be doing something crazier because this doesn't seem so crazy <laughs> to me. Like maybe it's a hundred miler all in one go. I don't know. But that's kind of where I come from, where initially something seems crazy to me. I I kind of fall into it and I get used to the idea and then it doesn't seem crazy. But then I get feedback from other people who say, that's crazy. Like, and then, I, and I'm just like, no, it's not. Like people do this all the time. People are doing quadzillas, four marathons in a row all the time. It's not crazy. Yeah. I mean, again, everything's sort of like on a spectrum and com yeah, it's all you're comparing it to, right? Like that. And so again, I think it's like, well, are you spending your time the way that you want to spend your time? And like, does that feel inherently fulfilling for you? Right. That it doesn't, again, like we don't have to be in agony all the time. Like, I think that that's, that is a story. It's, but it's also a both and because we don't have to be in agony all the time. And also I believe that it's incredibly valuable to do hard things, however we define that. Right. And that that's something that I thought about a lot throughout this hike. And it's something that I think about a lot in my life in general, that like that, you know, process that you said of, you know, you hear about something or you have an idea and you immediately reject it or, you know, you're resistant to it. There's a, there's a difference, I think, between, again, it's like following the emotional heat. So like, for example, scuba diving, I'm not interested. Like, it's not like a, oh my God, I feel like I could never do that. I'm just, I don't, I don't want to like, sure, it would be challenging in its own ways and like scary in its own ways, but like it doesn't have, there's no like pulse there for me, you know, versus like how I felt when I first heard about the Arizona trail to be like, oh my God, that that's too hard for me, but I wanted it. Right. And like that there's, there's a difference. Like just because something is hard doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing for you to do. Right. But it's like, just again, like being honest about like, where is the pull? Like yeah. what, you know, how do you want to spend your time? Like what would make you feel, you know, incredibly fulfilled? Well, it's funny that you men mentioned scuba diving because that's one thing I'm like, no, I can't do that. Or And jumping out of planes because I feel like there's so much risk involved by one wrong move that like and also, there's you death. Don't have, you don't have to do it. No, right? I don't. Like, that it's like, <laughs> and again, like it, we, it's not like everything that we're ever afraid of that we have to, you know, like I don't need to go like lay in a tank and like let spiders walk all over me. Like at some point you can just not want to do something and that's fine. Right. But it's again, it's being, but the difference between that and like, you know, all the stories that I've told myself that have like helped, held me back from writing a book. Like you know the difference between like genuinely this isn't the right fit for me or this isn't the right goal for me to choose versus 
I want this so much. And like, look at all these ways that I'm like trying to yeah, like protect sab- myself from having to do right, it. Right. Sabotaging you know? it. Yeah. yeah. So um, I want to change the subject a little bit here because we're, um, we're in Bend, Oregon, beautiful Bend, Oregon, which I understand has like 300 days of sunshine. <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah. To be honest, I honestly don't think that that's true. Okay. I think it's less. We were it's, told that before we moved here too. It, and yeah, it's the marketing tactic. Yeah. And that's what, yeah, that's what our friend said. Oh, it's 300, you know? And so coming from Seattle, I'm like sunshine, like yeah. this is amazing. Like in the middle of winter, you know, early winter. So what brought you here? And like, where, where did you come from right before Bend? Um, uh, came from LA. Um, originally I'm from New York. That's where I grew up in New York and in London. In the um, city? In mm-hmm. like in Manhattan, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What brought us to Bend? Um, it's actually kind of a funny story. Um, so I had moved to LA uh, with a previous partner, and my husband Paul moved to LA for me. So neither of us picked it, really. Like uh, you know, I wound up there through a set of circumstances. Right. He wound up there because I was there, and you know, um, LA, like anywhere has great qualities, but it just wasn't really the right fit for us. We wanted something that had, first of all, way less traffic and easier access to doing outdoor activities, smaller, quieter. And So you um, both shared that kind of outdoor activity or different activities, but yeah, that was something that we wanted. Um, I mean, my husband's from like the middle of nowhere in Minnesota. So, I mean, he didn't really want to live in a big city anymore. And I had, I had only ever lived in really big cities. So this was a really big change for me coming to Bend, but I was running pretty seriously at the time. And I used to be on, um, I'm sure being from Seattle, you're familiar with Wazelle. Mm -hmm. Um, but so I used to run on their little like ambassador team. They've since changed their team structure, but Um, I was on their team. And so I followed, you know, a bunch of their pro runner women um, on social media, on Instagram and uh, Little Wing, their group that, I mean, has gotten quite a bit smaller, but that trains here. Um, I followed them. I followed uh, my now friend, Lauren Fleshman, you know, like these runners and stuff that lived in Bend and they would post these pictures that were just like bananas, beautiful, like so gorgeous. And it sort of became, uh, I had never heard of Bend before, uh, like through Wazelle. And it became a joke. Paul, my husband and I would be stuck in traffic in LA you know, and we would say, oh, it's probably not like this in Bend. And that happened over, you know, a little period of time. We were like, we should probably go visit Bend because we knew that we wanted to move. And we were looking at, um, we were thinking about Boulder. We were thinking about, you know, San Luis Obispo. We were thinking about a couple of places that had some things in common. And we thought, all right, let's just like add Bend to the list. And so we booked a trip uh, to, to come up here. We drove up here and, um, you know, we figured, well, if we're going to be there, we might as well look at houses anyway because we knew that we wanted to buy a house. And, um, so we set up, you know, an appointment with uh, a broker up here and we got, we drove up here. We got here on a Thursday around 4 PM. We looked at five houses the next morning and bought one. We wow. literally hadn't been here for 24 hours, but we were like, yeah, okay, we should probably live here. So, which is again, anyone who knows me very aligned with like, I just, all just right. makes sense. Like I have no, I've moved the house that we're living in now is the 21st house or apartment I've lived in in my life. And I'm 32. So I've moved a ton. Um, but you've been in this house, what, six years or something? No, or, no, no. Or? Uh, three years. Okay. Three. three years now. Yeah. This is basically the longest that I've lived anywhere basically since I was child. Um, so for me, the geographic changes, picking up and moving, like that felt very comfortable. The settling in, I never thought that I was going to own a house. That wasn't a priority for me at all. It's something that my husband wanted more than I did. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't opposed to it. And you make compromises. So the, you know, that happened. The, the settling and like putting roots down, especially in a place that we didn't, we didn't know a single person when we moved here. So we, I mean, we kind of wound up here on a whim, basically. And how has it been just in terms of meeting people? Like what, like we arrived uh, like two days ago, John and I, we flew down from Seattle just to spend a few days here. And it's like, oh my gosh, like everybody is so freaking nice. Like, like everybody just wants to have a conversation and have a chat and say, are you moving here? Like, just like, because I guess a Apparently, everybody wants to move here <laughs> now, so everybody wants to know if we're moving here. But uh, how has the settling in been for you? Uh, I'm really happy here now. I had a very hard time the first year. Um, I think it's hard to make friends as an adult. I think that's something that people don't often talk about, especially, um, you know, we don't have kids. We're not having kids. It's uh, a big drinking culture here, too, It's a big drinking it? culture. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, not. it's not a drinking culture in the way, you know, that when I lived in San Francisco, that San Francisco is. It's a big, like beer culture I wouldn't say like it's not a big drunk culture 
but it's definitely a like go to the brewery. Right, there's you know, breweries type everywhere. Um, yeah, so basically a lot of uh, what I would say that like organic paths are into making friends. Like Paul and I both work from home, so we're not going to meet friends through work. We don't drink. We don't have kids, right? So like a lot of the the things, like the ways that I think would be easier to make friends or at least quicker to make friends aren't open to us. And so it definitely was tough at the beginning, but it did you time. ever, did you ever think like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Um, no, yeah, I mean, no, honestly, uh, I expected it to be hard. It's, you know, when you move somewhere and you don't know anyone, you know, it takes time. It takes time. You know, they say, you know, they, whoever they are, that it, you know, takes one to three years, you know, minimum for a new place to feel like home. And I have found, I mean, it's been three years and I now finally feel like really settled and have great friends and community and stuff. And, but part of it, honestly, I had to have a talk with myself about, well, I wasn't really trying very hard, right? Like people, like friends aren't just going to like magically appear on your doorstep, you know? So it was like, okay, again, with the pain point, like how lonely do I have to get in order to put myself out there more and do that. So, I mean, that's when things changed was when I started putting more of an effort in, surprise, surprise. And so now I'm super happy here, but I think that, yeah, it definitely took time. You grew up in New York. Your fam- Is your family still in New York? Uh, some of it. My, my parents are um, outside San Diego now, but you know, my brother, my nieces and stuff are still on the East Coast. Here. So you have one brother? Um, I have two half brothers, quite a bit, quite a bit older. And you knew them in New York? Like they, like your parents got together or your parent and step mom or dad got together. So you grew up with your step siblings? No. Well, so um, my dad was married for 24 years before he met my mom. So um, those are his sons oh, from that Oh, I marriage. see. From the previous. Yeah. They're, okay. yeah, they're half siblings, not step siblings. Got it. Um, so I'm my parents' only child. But the youngest of my two brothers, the one that I'm close with, um, he's 21 years older than me. So, you know, it certainly wasn't like growing up with siblings. It's more of sort of like an uncle relationship, I guess. Uh, yeah, but both my parents are from New York, uh, lived there and, um, then lived in London for six years, like in middle school, basically. So basically grew up between those two cities. And was, so it was more like you were an only child. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Yes. Because you're sibling. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that has given you uh, independence and also given you this kind of time in your head? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, it's hard to chart because you don't know what the other path would have been, right? That I don't know how I would have turned out if I would have had a bunch of siblings. But yeah, probably. I, I mean, as as my mother tells it, I've always been independent. Um, I don't mind doing things on my own, which isn't to say that it wasn't incredibly hard to not speak to someone or see another human for four days. I had no, I mean, I didn't realize until doing the Arizona Trail I don't think there's ever been a full day in my life where I haven't seen another human or at least communicate it. Maybe when I was really sick, you know, for a day or two when I lived alone, but even still you're talking to somebody on the phone that it was like a very strange experience. I mean, I host a podcast. I'm super extroverted, right? Like I need people to listen to my nonsense and there was nobody out there, you know? So it's like, yeah, but yeah, I'm comfortable doing things alone. I always have been. I grew up, I have three brothers, three older brothers, seven, nine, and 11 years older. So not certainly not 21 years older, but I always felt like kind of, I, I was an only child in my early teens, like through my teens. And I think I developed this level of independence where I'm totally fine on my own. And it hasn't really been until maybe the last 10 years or so since I've had my business that and I've and I've gotten to know so many more people and I've gotten to know really so many more women where I realize that it's the it's people who grew up really kind of as an only child or really independent that they can go out and travel the world by themselves and that someone who grew up with a bunch of siblings like I just never made that connection before it's only like like relatively recently I'm like oh yeah I can totally see how I was so independent I was forced to be independent because I spent so much time on my own and that if you've got a bunch of siblings around, you have a completely different experience and there's this, just this feeling that you've got to be around other people constantly Mm -hmm. because I I never had that. And I also, I also think that having brothers, like I had that kind of tomboy experience and that independence, whereas because women are supposed to be, or, you know, we are more social I just didn't have that, like I didn't have that sisterly feeling Mm -hmm. with others. Yeah, totally. But I can, I can imagine how uh, that kind of prepped you for being able to get out on the PCT 
and, you know, get out on the AZT, you know, to do these big trail hikes and not, and be okay with that. Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong. I was incredibly lonely. Like it's, so it's, again, it's a both and like I can be alone and I can do it, but I mean, I was like full scale miserable on of like a lot of the days, you know, and I think I would do a disservice to this hard thing if I pretended otherwise, like I definitely, there were two times that I almost quit. I cried a lot. What, what made it so miserable? It's hard. Hard things are hard. You know, it's. But, but specifically, was it altitude? Was it not having enough food? Was it you were afraid? It's all of it. I mean, you can't separate any of those things because you're living the intersection of all of those things, right? That it's, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, the altitude, no. I mean, I had a little bit of altitude headaches in the first week, just, you know, being up or eight, 9,000 feet, just at like the quick change, but it, it didn't get higher than that. So it wasn't like I was having, you know, breathing problems or anything like that. But it just, the combination of, physically it's very hard, right? Like you're hiking 20, 22, 25, 26 miles a day. Like that on its own is hard in perfect circumstances on a really nice trail. When you have all the food and water that you need, like that's hard. And then combine it with, you know, the lack of water. And, you know, once you get over 200, 300 miles into a trail and the hiker hunger kicks in and you're never not hungry, right? And so you have to ration your food, you're rationing your water. Like psychologically, that's a tough thing to go through. And obviously it's super privileged to be able to say, oh, I've never been thirsty like this before. You know, so all of that, plus I'm new. I mean, I grew up in Manhattan. I'm new to the outdoors. So the fear of like, is something going to try to eat my face in the night, right? Like that, just the fear of the outdoors in general, like very scary, like for sure. I'm terrified of that slightly less so now, but you know, the fear of being alone, the, as a woman. Yeah. Partially. Um, I mean, when you're like, were you afraid of your physical safety of, from a, from a male hiker? Not from other hikers. I mean, again, there really weren't that many other hikers. The, the majority of my fears are wilderness based and that has to do with a lack of experience or just, you know, like the more you do something and even by the end of the hike, you know, I remember the last night on trail, I was in my tent and, you know, I heard the sticks breaking. There was some animal out there and, you know, that at the beginning of the hike, I would have been so terrified. And I sat there for a moment. And I was like, okay, it doesn't sound that heavy. It's probably not a bear. It's probably, it's probably just a deer. <laughs> right. And like, even in that moment, I was like, yeah, change happens. Right. That like I was aware, but I wasn't terrified and I was able to go back to sleep. Right. So again, I think the only way like experience and exposure is the only way to overcome fears. I wish that it were different. I wish I could think myself out of it, but I can't. In terms of being afraid, specifically as a woman, afraid, no, aware, yes. So, you know, I remember, um, I think it was day eight, I came across hunting season when I was out there, out there. And that was definitely a concern for me. And I came across that you, you would do, were you concerned that you might accidentally be shot or that there were just hunters out <laughs> both, there? Both, both. You know, I, I, I chose to bring an orange back, like a bright orange backpack for a reason, right? Like just people out in the wilderness with guns, like you never know. Right. And I saw from a distance that there was a, a truck parked um, and I was pretty far out there. Um, you know, it was like a, just a dirt road and that there were two men, you know, in the full kind of camo gear, like with their guns, like hunters. And this is my first hunter interaction. And I was really afraid. Mm. Um, they were the nicest people. They, you know, every, all the, it's funny, all the hunters that I met on this trip were so kind, like giving me cold bottles of water, like thought it was like so badass what I was doing. And like, once I started to think about it, you know, they're, regardless of whether I agree with their sport choice or not, like they're also outdoors people, you know, like they respect. So I mean, not 98% of people are good and awesome, right. And are going to want to help you. But I was definitely aware of, yeah, I'm a woman alone. And there's like two dudes out here with guns. There was one other night where I try not to camp near roads or trailheads, like at least a mile away from that. Um, And I try to make sure if possible that like no one sees like where I go to camp, just to be aware of that. And um, just again, based on like the, the timing and when it was going to get dark and the trail conditions this one night I went, you know, I had been hiking the, the trail sort of went concurrent with a dirt road and I guess it was more heavily used than I thought. And as I was looking for uh, like kind of a place to leave, to go camp, uh, a guy in a pickup truck drove by me, just like waved, you know, and like went on his way. 
And I went what I thought was a decent ways off trail, but I guess I was still like in sight of like more in sight of the road than I thought. And I was starting to put together my tent and it was like probably 15 minutes from getting dark. And I had set up my tent. I was getting set up for the night. And um, that same truck drove by again in the opposite direction. And I thought, huh, that's interesting because where I was, there would be no, like, where would he have gone to then turn around? Like, I couldn't figure out. It's not like you, there wasn't a trailhead. There was, it was like, it just like, it struck me as like a tiny bit strange. And then, and I could tell that he saw where I was camped. And then like three minutes later, another truck with a couple of younger guys went by. And again, it was fine. They saw where I was camped and sort of my promise to myself on this hike was that I was going to trust my intuition, which I'm a very sort of cerebral, logical person. And I can often talk myself out of, oh, well, you're just being silly or, oh, you know, whatever. And that I was really committed to like really just following my intuition. I just had this like ping of you should move. Nothing scary happened. Did you move? Yeah. And I'm sure it would have been fine, but I just, better. Yeah. I just had this like, so, you know, and, and at that point I was really racing the, you know, the daylight. So I just like really haphazardly sort of like quickly packed up, you know, hiked out, went a different way, you know, and wound up. And that wound up being one of my scariest nights on trail because I, then it was like, I was still hiking in the dark and, you know, wound up, couldn't find anywhere like where the ground was good enough to set up my tent, wound up cowboy camping, like camping without a tent, you know, so I'm basically just like laying in my sleeping bag, like it, you know, and there's coyotes and elks bugling and, you know, all the things happening. And, oh my God, are these like men going to come back? And your, your imagination is sort of always your worst enemy when you're out alone doing something. Um, and everything wound up being fine, but I was aware of it, of course, in a way that, you know, a solo male hiker would never have to be. So speaking of that, you were actually offline and kind of out of touch a little bit when the whole Me Too meme was going on. Mm -hmm. did, did you know what was happening? Like, were you in touch at all in social media? Lightly. I like I sort of saw what was happening, but didn't really check in that much. I mean, it's mostly just a logistical thing of, first of all, I didn't have phone service that often and was always trying to conserve my battery, you know, and like spending a lot of time like scrolling through the internet is just not practical, you know, when you're like on day three out there. Um, but so yes, I was aware of it and have obviously have since like seen it and stuff since I got back. But no, I wasn't that like I was posting to Instagram and like interacting with friends and family. But, you know, one of the things and again, I mean, I, I there's huge privilege in being able to do something like this. I mean, privilege in so many different capacities, you know, financially and being able to take the time off work and flexibility and like having, you know, supportive friends and family. And like, I'm very aware of like, sure, as a woman, there is a vulnerability there, but being white, being cisgender, being straight, like, ha you know, having, I, obviously I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm rich, but I definitely ha you know, have money. And like, I'm very aware of all the different like intersecting privileges that make doing adventures like this possible. And not that you can't do it if you don't have those things. There's plenty of people in lots of different circumstances, but anyway, so all of this, that could be a separate conversation, but all of this to say that, you know, I consciously mostly checked out yeah, good. for this hike and, you know, that still keeping up a little bit, but, you know, I had been very involved, you know, in a lot of, let's say like political things in the months previous. And part of it was, okay, for these six weeks, I'm not going to be able to be as involved and as informed and doing the things that I usually do. And it's a privilege to be able to do that, you know, like to even be able to take space away from it means that a lot of the worst things are not impacting your everyday life. And yeah, so I wasn't entirely checked out, but consciously checked out a bunch. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so when you got back, did you go back through and kind of have you gotten up to speed on the Me Too and kind of all this, the sexual harassment and all these crazy stories that are coming out? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I don't think they're that crazy. I think, I think I'm horrified and not surprised is the best way that I can yeah, say. That's... Like, like, I wish that I were surprised. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean... I, I don't know any women. Um, I mean, obviously, of course, there's degrees of sexual harassment and sexual violence. But in some capacity, every woman that I know has experienced something on this Absolutely, spectrum. Absolutely. 100%. And so I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of conversation ar about, oh, my God, things are getting worse or, you know, anything in that capacity. No, I don't think anything's getting about worse. It. I think that it's getting uncovered. And I, 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 I am, I'm shocked in that. Yes, I agree. I think that... 
like uh, there's a statistic like in Papua New Guinea, I was there in August and I was in India in October. And the statistic for rape there is like 80% in Papua New Guinea, which has always blown me away. And then it's like 60, I think they say between 60 and 80% in India. And I think it's one in four women here in the US. And so like, I've always been shocked by those numbers, like, like these rape statistics. And then I, you know, then this whole Me Too thing happened. And I was like, well, wait a minute, it's 100% of sexual harassment in one form or another, you know, here. So I'm not, I, I am not shocked by that by all these women coming forward. But I am shocked about the like it is crazy like the louis ck thing it's like dude like what are you thinking like Mm -hmm. like that stuff blows me away because i can't i can't believe that anybody is that idiotic like really like i can't believe that the men are that idiotic and great for these women to you know to come out and finally start uh start talking about this Mm -hmm. you know so brave women yay but uh, I do think it's crazy. I am I am horrified by it. I'm surprised. Yeah. I am surprised by it. I wish that I were. I, I, I Yes, I'm horrified. You know, it's I'm finding it very, let's use the word interesting, watching the greater cultural conversation around this, like how quick people are to like defend the perpetrators of things or, well, what movies am I going to watch now if everyone's... G- I don't... That's not the point. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And just like man, the way that our, you know, patriarchal culture wants yeah. to uphold like the the feelings and privileges of white men. Like it's Oh, it's been great <laughs> conversation between John and I, my husband. We're just like he because he's horrified. Yeah. He he can't believe it. He's I agree totally with you. Shocked. I I've had some very interesting conversations with my husband too. And and, you know, with other a couple of other good white male friends who are uh, let's use the phrase waking up like for the first time that like because just because they're good people I mean I guess if we're going to define good people at like right. a base level of like yeah, not no, being a like sexual not, abuser like our right. bar is really low not masturbating but in front of women listen yeah. exactly right so people who haven't personally engaged in any of those behaviors and are you know respectful of women all those things watching them be shocked and like and not know what to do or how to even like that, that I think is that's what's most going to be most impactful and most interesting of like, uh, like, uh, you know, I I had an interesting conversation, you know, with a friend a few weeks ago about this, you know, that, that he's acknowledging like, oh, we, we do live in rape culture and I'm a man and I need to take, even though I'm not a rapist, I need to take responsibility for this. And what does it mean to like, you know, call out my other male, you know, for him saying, what does it mean to call out my other male friends when they like make jokes or if they cat call, if they do any of this, right? It's like being basically like stepping up and taking responsibility, even, you know, it's just because it's not your fault doesn't mean that it's not your responsibility. And I feel like, you know, we could have that in the in the gender, you know, or the conversation, the misogyny conversation. We could also have that in the race conversation, right? Like as white folks, it might not be our individual fault, but it doesn't mean it's not our responsibility, you know, and that there's a distinction there, you know, and watching the conversation and friends being like that at first they want to be really defensive. Well, not me, you know, hashtag not all men. We get it, right? Like if it's not about you, you don't have to say anything, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I think it's a horrifying and, and interesting time. I, I had sent something in this conversation with John about like, oh yeah, I've been like, uh, like exposed, like uh, been exposed to men, you know, like having them expose themselves to me for years. And he's like, what? Like you never told me this. And it's like, yeah, since I've been like 10 years old and it's like, it's not anything I was hiding. It's just like a fact of life. Yeah. So you don't go, Hey, I had this traumatic experience. It was just like, yeah, that was an experience that I had when I was 10, you know, or, you know, in subsequent years too. But it's just like, it's so natural that you don't even think to talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's, and that's crazy in itself. Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, going back to being a woman doing, you know, whether it's travel, you know, like you were talking about or the type of hiking and stuff that I do alone. Yeah, I get a lot of questions from women too of like, aren't you afraid? You know, and I think that that's partially makes sense because of everything that we're just talking about. And sort of like my thought behind that is I'm not going to not live my life. Statistically, I'm way more likely 
you know, to die in a car accident or to have something like that happen in a big city that like you're relatively unlikely to have something like that happen out in the wilderness like that, right? Like it's, it's just that because it's so unfamiliar, the fear level is so high, you know, and I brought, I did, I didn't last year, but I brought with me this year, a small thing of mace, you know, luckily never needed to use it. Don't know if it would have been enough if I would have had to, but it's like, it's sort of, again, with the both and like being aware of the vulnerabilities, you know, of being a woman alone and also living my life anyway. Like, I'm not going to not do it because of that, you know, and it, it's always interesting when you make any kind of like life choice that's, you know, 2% or more like outside of the real, real mainstream, watching other people's reactions to that, which always have way more to do with them than they do with you, right? Like their reactions are about them. But it was funny, the couple of people that I met on the hike, not actually on trail, but like in towns or whatever, and they would find out what I was doing. And um, I had two different people say, once they found out that I was married, your husband let you do that? And I'm like, well, my husband's not my keeper. So he didn't let me do anything, you know, which I guess could be another thing if you, if you want to talk about that, but that it's, he didn't, he didn't let me, you know, (laughs) but it's just, it's funny. Like what comes up with people, you know, and they say, I could never do that. I could never leave home for that long. I know. know, Actually, I, I know we're running out of time here, but that is one of the things that I wanted to, to chat about briefly too, because I know women who can't kind of pull themselves away from their home for, for, you know, four or five days, let alone six weeks. And I imagine it's not having, it's not like Paul letting you do that, but it's a matter of having a conversation about it. We had a lot like, of conversations about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think so, first of all, we don't have kids and we're not having kids. So, I mean, that's a life choice that sure there's stuff that we're missing out on, but the, we have a lot more freedom and flexibility when it comes to both disposable income and time, right? So I'm very aware of the fact that it would be different if I had young kids at home. Not to say, again, of course, there are mothers that are, hashtag not all everything, right? <laughs> um, but I think that that's, that's real. And yeah, I, in my marriage specifically, yes, I'm new to long distance hiking, but I've never not been this person, meaning someone who likes to travel, not necessarily put down roots. Like for the majority of my adult life, everything that I own fit in my car and I wasn't interested in buying a house. I've never worked what you would call a traditional job. So it's either been seasonal things that then allowed me, you know, I would make money, save a bunch of money and then like take time off to travel or do whatever or working for myself in some capacity and have supported myself, you know, my entire adult life through doing non-traditional things. But that sort of like permanent, stable, in the same place all the time, the paycheck comes every two weeks, like that's never been something that is appealing to me. So that's not a surprise, right? It's not like I completely all of a sudden did this 180 from this like very uh, home body, you know, work in this nine to five job. And then all of a sudden I want to go out and do this thing. And he had to like reorient his entire understanding of me and our marriage. So I think part of it was baked in, in that this isn't a surprise to him. Right, he knew it's what he was dif- getting it's into. It's a different, it's a different activity, but it's the same, you know. And but not to say that it didn't cause some friction, you know. That we've had, we've had a, a, a series of conversations like over the last couple of years about sort of, I wouldn't say me feeling trapped, but his, if we look at like my, what my individual life choices would be, lifestyle choices, I would not have bought a house. I would have a lot more flexibility. I would own a lot fewer things, right? And if you look at his individual choices, you know, he does want the house and he is a homebody and like doesn't like being gone for more than a week and wants to be home with the cats and like loves his nine to five job that he works, right? And so it's like, they're very different. And so we have found compromise and overlap. And, you know, we did buy a house and we do have roots put down. And, you know, for a while I felt guilty about leaving for so long because we, our choices are different. Like our individual preferences, sort of like lifestyle preferences that I just described are different. His are more quote normal. They're more accepted. They're more mainstream. And It took me a long time to understand and really believe that just because that's true doesn't mean that they're more valuable choices or that they're more worthwhile choices or that they're more accepted choices. That I was giving up, and not by his request, but I had sort of given up a a lot of my, not a lot of myself, but this part of myself, and I was trying to fit myself into the life that he wants. Mm -hmm. 
And that he didn't ask me to do that. I felt like that's what I was back to the shoulds. I felt like that's what I should do. I should be home all the time. It should be enough for me that we have this beautiful house. And like, it was a lot of the dialogue of what's wrong with you that you can't just be happy here. And again, that hit a pain point where it got to be, I, you know, and I uh, struggle with depression anyway, and it got to be a thing that was a big you know, went through some periods of depression and that I just felt like I'm not doing the things that I want to do. Because, when was this? Uh, just periodically over the last couple of years. Okay. So here when you were in Bend. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. then, so then you add a new community to it. So you come into a community where you don't have a strong set of friends maybe, sure. or just feeling a little bit lost in terms of that, you throwing everything in the mix. Yeah. And, you know, just sort of settling into this, you know, okay, I'm married and, you know, we're given a lot of information culturally, often like subconsciously, especially as women is like, here's what it looks like to be a good wife. Here's what it looks like, you know, and all, all of that type of stuff. And, you know, so I guess all of that to say it, it sort of hit a breaking point of, hang on, just because I want something that's less traditional doesn't mean that I'm immature. It doesn't, because we have this thing of like, just settle down. Like, you know, that was for your twenties, but you know, you're not a kid anymore. And uh, all the, all the things, all the stories that we tell ourselves. Right. And for me to actually have this moment of like, I actually don't believe that that's true. Like, I think that there's lots of different ways to live a life and it doesn't have to look this way. And just because, you know, anyway, so that led to us having a series of conversations about these things. And I'm lucky and grateful that Paul's super, supportive. And, you know, we were able to, and and his fear was always, he's like, I don't want to hold you back. Like, I'm afraid that I'm holding you back from like the things that you want to do. And, you know, it was sort of a thing where I was feeling guilty and, or like he was feeling guilty and I was feeling resentful. It just like, it, it wasn't great. And so, you know, essentially what we came down to, I did the hike last year that was easier because it was here in Oregon. So I got to see him a couple of times and it was shorter. It was only 26 days. And, but then, you know, once I wanted to do this and do this longer, the conversation that we had, which is essentially my favorite question to ask another person when, when you're in any sort of compromise thing like this is what would need to be true in order for this to feel good for you, right? Or like some variation of like actually asking them because a lot of, I was operating on a lot of assumptions. I assume that like I'm supposed to do this as a wife. I assume that he wants this for me. Like that's not fair. Actually ask the other person, like I want to go on this hike for six weeks. What would need to be true in order for you to feel good about that? And then hear them and listen and talk about those things. And don't get me wrong, like I missed him for sure. And I was like horribly lonely a lot of the time. And also it was worth it, right? So the fact that you came back after the first trip, the PCT, and that you came back and you had a happy marriage or, you know, you worked through your stuff, but you came back to him, that that goes a long way in like... him accepting the fact, not letting you go, but him accepting the fact like, oh, okay, maybe this can work out. And we can, you know, we can find this way that satisfies her needs of a little bit of freedom, spreading her wings a little bit and challenging herself. But I can trust the fact that she's going to come back and we're going to, we're going to. Yeah. And, but, and also, even if I wouldn't have gone, that's no safeguard to the fact that I'm not going to leave or that we're not going to get divorced. So it's like part of it that that was helpful for us was acknowledging there's like inherent uncertainty in relationships, right? And the other thing that was really helpful was for us to actually sort of define what was important in our marriage for ourselves. Like I remember a long time ago, I read an article that a woman had written, I think it was her 15 year wedding anniversary. And it was a sort of like her thoughts and advice from like a happy 15 year marriage. And one of the things that she said that always stuck with me, this was obviously long before I was married myself, was that a marriage, I mean, and obviously, again, there's lots of different ways to do a marriage, but if you, a, a two person partnership, right, or however, however you think of it, that you guys are a team, and no one else gets to be on the team, and no one else has to understand the team's rules. And this idea that like, you have to figure out what works for you. And if you and your partner are cool with it, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And I realized that I was succumbing to a lot of like, what are other people going to think about me as a wife and a woman? If I like leave my poor husband, who's like at home alone, like working while I'm out doing this thing. Like I was telling myself that story. And then I was like, hang on, doing a hike like this would be his fucking worst nightmare. Sorry if I'm supposed to swear. No, Um, please do. (laughs) um, Would be his worst nightmare. He doesn't like traveling. All he wants to do is like be home, make donuts, play with the cats, work his job that he loves and ride his bike. Like he's a homebody. Like he's actually happy doing, he doesn't want to go on this trip. If he did, we would find a way to do it together. Right. And that it was like, we were like, okay. We, and the conversation that finally like broke the ice for us was realizing 
you know, his main bike racing season is cyclocross, which is in the fall. So he's training a lot during the summer. And that's basically like key hiking time. And so we weren't spending that much time together during the summer. And finally, we were like, what if the summer's the off season of our relationship? Not that we're not still married, but like we were sort of only giving each other our leftover energy because we had other priorities. What if that's fine? And when and, and we sort of worked it out to be like, winter is going to be the time where like the things we love doing together, cooking, baking, you know, going snowshoeing, doing this, like watching movies, being by the fireplace that we're like, we're going to spend a ton of time together and do all of the things that like we love as a couple during these months of the year. And then he can go yeah, and that's a great go on like a multi-hour it. bike ride yeah. and not feel guilty. And I can go on a multi-hour hike and not feel guilty. And so it's, again, it's just not that that's the right way to do it, but like we're sort of, and we're still figuring it out, but figuring out what has to be true for us in order for this to work in our marriage. And I will tell you as much as I was lonely and he was lonely and we were both frustrated at times, like since I have been home and granted it's only been whatever, a week and a half or something, it's good to miss each other. Like I like to come home and be able to like, oh, my husband's really attractive. And like, I want to, you know what I mean? Like that that's the kind of thing that like on the day to day when all you're doing is like, you know, in your pajamas, like stressed out about work, you forget. So I'm also trying to see that like this non-traditional path also has a lot of benefits. Like he missed me a lot. So he appreciates me now that I'm home and I appreciate him. And you know, that obviously, and again, that sounds cliche, but it's cliches are cliche for a reason Yeah, that, you know, me pursuing my own things and like, him pursuing his own things and both of us learning how to like meet our own emotional needs and not be quite so dependent has been wonderful. I agree because John and I spend quite a bit of time separately because of my travel, you know, but we've also been able to figure out ways to travel together. But it's that same thing. It's like I was just in India for two and a half weeks and we were in touch a lot now with, you know, with the Internet, you know, and just accessibility. It's so much easier to communicate than it was even 10 years ago. Then we get back together and it's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Yeah. You know, and it's Be fun like, for oh, me to be home and totally. it's, it's fun for him to have had his bachelorhood for two and a half weeks. Exactly. And slob around the house totally. or whatever he, whatever he does. But yeah, it's all good. Hey, I'm aware that you're going to yeah. need to um, uh, leave shortly, but do you have time for just a couple more quick sure, questions? absolutely. Morning routine. Do you have one? Do I have one? Um, not a strict one. I have tried to give my, it's funny, like I'm in the process of settling back into that now and figuring out what do I want my routines to be like for this winter? Because I think the nice thing about taking a break, whether it's two weeks or six weeks or whatever away from your regular life is that it can help you to sort of reevaluate what works and what doesn't work, you know? So right now, um, just like mostly settling back in at home, but I tend to bookend my day with reading. It's the last thing that I do at night and it's the first thing that I do in the morning. Usually different books, like, you know, nothing too engaging at night, something probably more research heavy and then something maybe a little bit more positive and like ass kicking in the morning. So yeah, I usually will just like grab my Kindle and read in bed for like 20 minutes before I get up. Um, Tend to get up, I'd say anywhere between like 5.15 and 6.30. Depends on, you know, obviously it's like still dark now until like 7 a.m., which like makes it harder. I am definitely a morning exerciser, especially with running, you know, prefer. So it's, it's sort of just reading, getting up, having, you know, whatever I'm going to have for breakfast, usually going for a run if I'm running or doing, you know, whatever that thing is before like starting the rest of the day. But I don't have like a really strict morning routine. When you run, are you running just in town here or do you head out into the hills and Depends go for the big weather. runs? Depends on the weather. Okay. Um, I mean, well, right now. So you're a trail runner also? Um, I mean, sure, I'm not like running up mountains or whatever, but I do love running the trails and stuff around here. But I mean, again, I'm like, I ran three miles this morning and that's the most that I've run since like March. So, you know what I mean? We're not talking, we're talking so like, back into it. At, like little around the neighborhood things and pretty soon we're going to be in treadmill season anyway. So that's right. Three to four feet of snow here in the, <laughs> in the winter time. Um, I always ask people, uh, what does it mean to you to be bold? To be bold. Um, I think the first thing that came to my mind, which I guess the first thing is usually the right thing, is surprising yourself. I don't know. I think there's like an, a sort of connotation of boldness that has a lot to do with other people's opinions. You Like what you were saying before, like other people think it's like so crazy that you're doing these four marathons or, you know, whatever, that like not being bold. Yeah, like this idea of like impressing yourself or like surprising yourself and not shying away from the thing that you feel like you're supposed to do or make or stand for because 
it's not going to be universally well received. Anything that's worth doing or making is not going to be universally well received. Like one of my favorite things to do when I'm feeling a lack of confidence is I will go on Amazon and I will look up, you know, let's say my, my favorite one or two like books of all time or whatever, things that like really had like a profound impact on me. And I'll go read the one star reviews <laughs> to be like this book that like changed my life that I would buy for everyone that I know that I think is like a work of art. These 150 people think it's trash. So you can't, right? Like that it, is it's, really interesting. But you just be like, you can't like you can't the, like the, the, and I feel like that, especially in our climate, you know, politically in terms of social justice, in terms of act, like you got to stand for something. So I think that has like a big thing with boldness too. like stand for what you stand for. And like, not everyone's going to be here for it. And okay. You know, easier said than done. And I'm definitely working on that, like needing less validation, caring less about being liked. That's sort of my like personal goal for 2018 is to care less about being liked by strangers on the internet. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> to be determined how that goes. <laughs> you don't seem to be someone who is concerned about being liked online. Well, I mean, I, 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 I would be, I think you're hard pressed to find a woman who isn't at some capacity. Like, again, it's all on a spectrum. I don't not do things necessarily, but I'm aware of it. And like when people say mean things to you, it doesn't feel good, you know, and just, but being resilient enough to take a stand for things. And then finally, where can people find you or support you? Uh, yeah, so NicoleAntoinette.com is where pretty much most things live, but my podcast, Real Talk Radio, that's, I guess, the main like public work that I do is through that. Mm-hmm. So, And then you have a Patreon page I do. so people yeah. can support your blog. The show is um, is crowdfunded, so no ads or sponsors or anything like that. It's crowdfunded. The community's awesome. going to be doing a bunch of live events in 2018, which is, so I did the first two earlier this year, which was incredible to like take this idea of Real Talk, like honest conversations offline and in person. Um, with small groups of, of, you know, like really fun, warm, honest folks. So um, yeah, that will be coming. Do you know where your future? I'm figuring that out right now. I'm talking to my community about it. Definitely Seattle, San Francisco, LA, Boston, and DC. And then other cities sort of to be determined based on like where the community lives. We have a little, not like vote, but sort of going on right now, conversation going on within the Patreon community of, okay, where do you live? Do you have a, know a space for like 12 to 14 people? You know, that type of thing. So my goal is 10 cities next year. And to really this, this idea of like the value of honest conversations and especially with like no agenda or no perfect answers, just essentially like this, just yeah. like talking about what's true, um, it, I think is incredibly powerful. Great. Well, we'll um, watch out for that. And I didn't get to half of the stuff I wanted to chat with you about, but the <laughs> conversation was fabulous. So it just means we have to talk again. There you go. Hey, anytime <laughs> in you're in future. Bend. I know. Or when you're in Seattle. There you go. Yeah. Thanks again, Nicole. I Absolutely. appreciate it. Oh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And if so, please take time to check out Nicole's podcast. I'm sure you'll find some great conversations there that will resonate with you. A reminder that if you like what you hear, uh, please subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play and leave a review. Perhaps more importantly, please share this and other episodes with women and men whom you think might enjoy it. Not everyone's clued into how wonderful podcasts are, so if you've got a friend who doesn't know how to download them, take a moment to give them a lesson. You can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com. You'll find show notes and all of my podcast episodes on beboldpodcast.com. If you feel like being bold yourself, why not join me on one of my tours? Right now, I've got spots available on Tanzania, and that includes a safari and Kilimanjaro trek, uh, Papua New Guinea, as well as culinary tours to Santa Fe, New Orleans, and Seattle. You'll find all of those on wandertours.com. If you'd like to connect with me, you can friend me on Facebook, and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. Sign up for my newsletter on the Wanderlust and Lipstick site, and you'll receive a series of tips for making your travels safer. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold podcast. Until next time, be bold.